806, 55 KRC, the talk station. A very happy Tuesday to you in spite of the torrential downpour coming through the area. Remember, flash flood, watch till 1030. Please, please, please drive as safely as you can. Lots of water on the roads. I don't want anybody sliding off. As promised, on the telephone, Jim Hunt, author of Warrior. Frank Sturgis, the CIA's number one assassin spy who nearly killed Castro but was ambushed by Watergate. Jim, a distinct pleasure to have you on the program today. Thank you, Brian. I'm, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. And uh, if, for those who are not aware of his background, he is a fellow litigation attorney. He's been at it for over 35 years. He does civil and uh, well, you do civil and criminal cases. And you are actually related to the subject matter, Frank Sturgis. Can you tell me your relation to Frank? Frank uh, was my uncle. He married my aunt Janet in about 1960 in Miami, and uh, that's how I met him. I met him through her. I, when I was in high school back in those days, I would go to Miami uh, in the summers and spend time with him, and then. My freshman year of college in 1963, I lived with uh, Frank and Janet in Miami, so I got to know him very well. I would say that, and that would do a lot to substantiate your wealth of knowledge that you put in here about this guy, this amazing guy. Listen to this summary. Trained guerrilla armies in 12 countries on three continents. continents. Spearheaded uh, plots to overthrow governments of Cuba, Panama, Guatemala, and Dominican Republic, and Haiti. Rescued actresses, assassinated dictators, trained guerrillas, fought in civil wars, and even accused of assassinating John F. Kennedy, finally undone by Watergate. That man has had quite a life, and I have not even scratched the surface of what this guy did. What was the most amazing thing in your research on this this, um, this amazing guy, Frank Sturgis, that you ran into that he did in his in his life? You know, it's it's hard to characterize just one thing. Nah, I suppose. His, his life involvement uh, against uh, Fidel Castro and... You know, he did 150 to 175 covert missions into Cuba uh, after he left Cuba in, in June of 1959, fighting against Fidel. But he Frank, worked with him up before that time, right? Yeah, you know, Frank first met Fidel in 1957 in Miami. He met him through an aunt and uncle that he had. Uh, uh, the uh, aunt was a Cuban lady who had been displaced by Batista when Batista took over Cuba in the early 1950s. And through them, uh, he met Fidel. Fidel was in Miami trying to raise money and support for his his revolution. And Frank said, well, I don't have a whole lot of money, but I know something about guns and ammunition and guerrilla warfare, which he did. He was an expert in those things. He began running guns into the Cuba for Fidel. He would either load up his uh, Cadillac with, with these things, and there was a ferry boat that ran from Key West over to Havana that he would use to take stuff in, or sometimes he would fly a small airplane and land up in the mountains in Oriente Province. Uh, was he was, so was this a freelance operation? Was he was he doing it at the behest of uh, CIA or some other govern, uh, U.S. government entity? Brian, when he first started, it was a freelance. He, How about he told that? Me that? He told me that from day one he was totally mesmerized by Fidel. Fidel promised to bring Cuba back to popular democracy. Before Batista, Carlos Prio had been the president back in the 1940s, and, and Cuba had, had true democracy at that point. And so Fidel's selling point to Frank and, and the, the rest of them, was it you know let's let's bring democracy back to Cuba, and when that didn't happen after the revolution was successful in June of or I'm sorry January of 1959, and began to uh, go over to the communist side, Frank said I'll see you and uh, left uh, left Cuba in June of 1959 with a B-25, and a C-46 and $750,000. And then spent literally the rest of his life in a, a war against Fidel Castro to try to restore a democracy to Cuba. Well, he actually, as you point out in the book, served next to Che Guevara. I, it, was there at no time during his gun running and discussions with uh, Castro and Guevara and the rest of the guerrillas that he was working with, no indication whatsoever that these guys were ac actually communist? Was this some kind of transformation, post-revolutionary, a la like Woody Allen bananas? You know, as soon as the guys get in power, they go completely completely opposite direction of what they promised? Well, here's what Frank said about that. He said, as far as Che Guevara is concerned, he was probably a communist all along. But in August of 1958, just before the uh, success of the revolution in January 59, Frank uh, ran into two Venezuelan guys who wanted to come and see Fidel, and he took them to see Fidel. Well, it turned out they were two communists, and they were coming to see Fidel to pledge support of the Communist Party in Venezuela for his revolution. Uh, when the when Fidel took over in January of 59, Frank described it as a pink type of government. In other words, it wasn't totally red. It wasn't totally communist. There was a struggle going on between the communists on, one, on the one side and people like Frank uh, uh, on the other who were any communists. And he said that Fidel was probably a socialist, 
but certainly was not committed to the thing that, that Frank hated about communism, Brian, was the, the totalitarian aspect of it, the, the lack of personal freedoms that you have, you know, that we have in this country. Right. I mean, and, that's the, and, your your description sounds like the battle currently being waged in Congress right now, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Does, uh, you know, what goes around comes around, doesn't it? Oh, boy. Uh, well, the, the, but anyway, go ahead. Uh, so from that point, so he felt betrayed by Fidel and uh, got into a bitter conflict with him. After, I mean, there were attempts on Fidel's life that he was involved in, uh, covert missions into Cuba. Frank was never uh, on the actual payroll of the CIA, but he was. He did plenty of what I would call independent contracting jobs. So he's a freelancer. He's a, he's a, he's a, he's a, he's a spy for hire. That's pretty. That's pretty wild. I mean, I, I I always figured, you know, guys like this were were from the get go always employed and trained by CIA, then sent out. This is someone, as you point out, started by running guns out of Cuba and ends up getting approached by, and I guess does contract work for the CIA, but is not really a you know a, a government employee, so to speak. At least that's what it sounds right. like. Yeah, no, they didn't take any withholding from his check. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Well, I, um, and, and you mentioned in the book that he is uh, he assassinated dictators. I guess at some point he tried to assassinate Fidel Castro. Many attempts were made on Castro's life. I know some of them were documented in uh, uh, in Bill Buckley's spy novels. I don't know if you ever read any of those, but um, yeah, they, I, very historically accurate, even though fiction. But um, the, the the attempts on Castro's life are, 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 are renowned. I guess he he actually tried to kill Castro himself. Well, when he was still in Cuba in the first six months of 1959, there were at least three occasions that he had uh, put together uh, a plot to, to assassinate Fidel. Two of them involved um, Fidel and his brother Raul and Che Guevara all being picked off by snipers. And then the third one involved a uh, plastic explosives that was going to be planted in an office that Fidel was going to be at. But he never got to go ahead. He never got to go ahead from the CIA. At that point, Frank was actively uh, per- or cooperating with the CIA. Uh, because of Fidel's uh, communist uh, leanings and so forth, and um, but he never got to go ahead to do it. After Frank left Cuba, he was involved in uh, several other assassination attempts. One uh, involved a woman by the name of Marita Lorenz, who had been a lover of, of Fidel's, and uh, then she became a friend of, of Frank's, and she went to uh, Cuba to poison Fidel's yeah. pills. And, and she, she, didn't she hide him in a jar of cold cream or something? She did, and they and then she said, "Well, they they uh, they melted, uh, so I couldn't use them." Frank thinks probably, you know, her love for Fidel may have gotten in the way of what her mission was at that time. Indeed, uh, but no, he, uh, and because of his CIA contacts uh, in these anti Castro activities, uh, that's what really got him into Watergate. Uh, he was brought into Watergate by some of the same people that had been involved in the anti Castro stuff in Miami, and. Uh, it's a long story, but the bottom line is uh, we believe that uh, we, being myself and my co-author, that Frank and the three Cubans, the burglars, were not guilty, even though they were caught red-handed, because they believed they were on a uh, legitimate uh, mission of national security. They believed that there was going to be evidence that Fidel Castro was funneling money to the Democratic National Party. And really? What if they'd only learned how to tape a door open without you know people walking by seeing it? Then they, it, would, it would never have happened, would it? Well... <laughs> Here's what, yeah, you know how that has occurred. I mean, Frank, Frank was the first. Uh, Frank and Virgilio Gonzalez, the locksmith, were the first people to go into Watergate that night. And when he got there, he saw that this tape was missing uh, from the door. And the tape had been put there earlier in the day by G. Gordon Liddy and E. Howard Hunt, right? And 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 James McCord. And so Frank called back on the walkie-talkie and said, "We've got to call this thing off. There's something going on." Well, McCord said, "No, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead." So they went in. They all got inside, and then once they were inside the offices, McCord told Rolanda Martinez, one of the burglars, that he had to go back across the street to the Howard Johnsons, where they had kind of set up their staging uh, for the operation, to get some equipment. And Rolanda said, well, when you leave, put the tape back on the door, go across the street, come back, make sure you take the tape off. So McCord leaves, comes back. Rolanda said, did you take the tape off? Oh, yeah, I took the tape off. Well, guess what? He didn't do that. He left the tape on there, and what happened was the security guard walked by and saw it. Saw the tape, and that's what called, uh, caused him to call the uh, D.C. police. Well, I, I always heard it was the positioning of the tape more than the tape being there because they taped it so that it was exposed on the front side of the door, keeping the lock open. You could have taped it vertically up and down on the lock to keep it open. It would have had the same effect, and no one would have seen it. But this exactly. is. Exactly. <laughs> you, you could have used. 
You could have used cellophane tape instead of masking tape, right? <laughs> you know, they could have used Frank when dealing with the tape, I think. Frank delegated to the wrong person that day. Well, uh, it's all... know, they... oh, go ahead. Go, no, no, go ahead, Jim. No, I was just going to say, uh, you know, E. Howard Hunt was uh, really behind this thing as well as G. Gordon Liddy. And, uh, you know, Hunt was a spy. He was a CIA guy, but he wasn't so much of an operations person. You know what I mean? I mean, he wasn't out right. in the field that much. And uh, he was a little gung-ho and over the top, and, and I think that's one of the reasons that they that at least contributed to uh, their getting caught. But basically, Frank and the, uh, the three Cubans that he was caught with believed that this guy McCord was a plant uh, put in there by the CIA to disrupt the mission, and that's that's what that's what happened. Uh, there was a struggle going on between the CIA and President Nixon at the time over some files that Nixon wanted to get his hands on, and um, Frank believes that the CIA saw an opportunity to bring Nixon down, and that's that's how it happened. Well, this whole book, the, the book, and I'm speaking with author Jim Hunt, who wrote it along with Bob Rich, Warrior, Frank Sturgis, the CIA's number one assassin spy who nearly killed Castro, was ambushed by Watergate. Um, it, just a, I mean, a couple of anecdotal things. The book is chock full of missions and information and, and all this thing. You, you, you guys actually sat down, because you were related to them, sat down and made napalm bombs together? I did. When, I was, <laughs> when I was in high school, uh, I was, on one of my trips, I uh, was there, and Frank said, here, let me show you something. We got in the backyard. He opens up this thing like a paint can, and it's got this jelly stuff in it. He put it on a stick, and he lit it, and, man, it was it just you know burned all of a sudden. Right. It was napalm. And uh, later uh, during that visit, we actually made bomb. We they were going to use these bombs to drop on the sugar fields in in, in Cuba to kind of disrupt the economy. And um, I did. I, I helped to make these bombs, and then I went back to my uh, aunt and uncle's house because I was leaving the next day to come back to Cincinnati. Actually, and um, Frank uh, stayed there. And I found out after I got back home that Frank and the rest of them had been busted by the uh, FBI. Uh, for making bombs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it just shows you you can you can be on the right and wrong side of the law at the same time. It's all in great detail. Warrior Frank Sturgis, the CIA's number one assassin spy who nearly killed Castro, was ambushed by Watergate by my guest Jim Hunt, along with Bob Rich. Jim, what I've done is put a copy of the Amazon link on my blog page at 55krc.com so people can easily get a copy of this. It qualifies for free shipping. And uh, is there any other website you'd like me to add, Jim? No, that's fine. Can I mention one other thing? Yeah, of course Thank you can. 20- May the 25th, I'm going to be doing a book signing at Joseph Beth over at Rookwood. Oh, uh, great. For the book. So uh, they usually start those around 6 o'clock in the evening. Wonderful. We'll look forward to having you in town. Jim, can't thank you enough for your time today on the phone. A fascinating book, and I'm very much looking forward to reading about Frank Sturgis. Thank you for talking to me this morning, Brian. I appreciate it. You have a fantastic week. 819.